Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. Hello and welcome to the Neil Before Pod interview segment. I'm your host Craig and for this episode I have the absolute pleasure of interviewing Greg Weissman about his career in general and a large focus on gargoyles. This is the first of a two-part series of interviews I did with Greg with the second part following soon. Also, this part of the interview was recorded in 2018 but was believed lost in the Great Hard Drive Fire until recently on Earth. Just like the gargoyles. Enjoy! I'm here with Greg Weissman, the creator of Gargoyles and Spectacular Spider-Man. Thank you very much for coming on. Happy to be here. So how are you doing this Well, this afternoon for you, this evening for me? I'm doing quite well, thanks. Good. So I thought we'd start with a little bit about you. How did you get your start in your career and kind of what inspired you to get into the things that you've gotten into? You've done a lot of animation work. You know, how did you get into that field? Well, I started in comic books in the 80s. And while I was working at DC Comics, I had a writing partner named Carrie Bates. And Carrie knew a guy named Roger Slifer, who was a story editor on a bunch of shows for a company called Sunbow. And Carrie and I pitched a number of different premises, springboards to a bunch of different shows, most of which we did not sell, but we did manage to sell one episode to Gem and the Holograms, and we wrote that. That was my first television credit. I was back around, uh, I'm going to say, 87-ish, give or take. And I thought that would lead to this huge career in television, and it led to absolutely nothing. (laughs) <laughs> a year later, I left D.C., at least I left my staff job at D.C., and moved to Los Angeles, which is where I'm from originally, and I uh, went to graduate school at the uh, University of Southern California. And while I was there, I started doing these informational interviews. I would contact various people in the industry and not try and get a job. And I was able to say that I was teaching at USC. I had a contract to teach. I couldn't take a job if they offered it to me. But I just want to find out more about the industry. And there were some people who never called me back. There were other people who responded but weren't interested in talking to me or were too busy or whatever. But there were a number of people who did not mind spending half hour to an hour sitting with some dopey kid and talking about themselves and what they do, kind of what I'm doing now. So I had a bunch of meetings. I had meetings with live action movie people, and I had one meeting with the head of television at Disney, a guy named Gary Kreisel, and we hit it off. And it was clear that we did right out of the gate. I think he liked my background. It was a combination of my uh, liberal arts degree, and I studied in Oxford. And so I had this sort of higher end education but I had worked in comic books, and what he knew that I didn't know at the time was that he was launching a new division for television animation at Disney. And so he thought I might be good for that. He was tired of talking to writers who all they knew were the latest Spielberg or Lucas film. And I'm not knocking those things, but I think his point at the time was they were just sort of giving him copies of copies, but I had this background education in the classics, and he liked that, but he also knew that because I'd worked in comics, I wouldn't turn my nose up at working in cartoons, which was, of course, true. So a year or so later, when I did finish at USC, I contacted him again. He had me speak to Bruce Cranston, who was head of development at TV Animation, and I had a meeting with Bruce that I thought went really well, and which Bruce later told me was horrible. Um, <laughs> but Gary felt strongly that I'd be an asset. So Bruce said, what the hell? And he hired me. So I really started in animation when I started in 1989 at Walt Disney TV Animation as a staff assistant. And then I worked my way up there. Longer story. I don't know how much detail you want, but I worked my way up there, director of series development, during which time I developed a series called Gargoyles and then moved over to be a producer and worked at Disney till 96, went to DreamWorks from 96 to 98, 
and then went freelance. And I was a freelancer on a number of different shows, ranging from Joshua Troopers, Max Steel, Men in Black, Witch, Team Atlantis, Ben 10, Kim Possible, all sorts of stuff, all the way up until very recently, just a few years ago, when I went on staff at Nickelodeon for a show called Shimmer and Shine. It was the first time I'd been on staff anywhere until then. And then uh, just a couple of years ago, I came back to Warner Brothers to do the third season of Young Justice. Uh, and I was on staff for a couple of years here. And But we're not quite done with Young Justice. I'm back to being a freelancer. And that's the big picture view of my career, I guess. So does the, the freelance thing appeal to you, working on different things with different people and learning different sides of how different shows work? Is that something that appeals to you a lot? Or do you like the kind of staff side of it where you're in one place for a long time and working consistently on the same thing? There have been times when I've enjoyed being a freelancer, but for the most part, it's tough. And I feel like, you know, when I started at Disney, I thought I'm going to spend my whole career here. And it obviously didn't work out that way. Yeah. Um, and I... I think there have been times, definitely, when I've landed someplace as a freelancer and thought this would be a good home, and then it, you know, the show ends or whatever, and I'm moving on again. I think now, and you know, I'm 55 years old. I think now I love to find a home, you know, a mm-hmm. place where I could just do good work and not constantly be searching for what my next gig is. And I do love working with lots of different people, but that's going to happen anywhere. Yeah. Um, but I think those days of sort of finding a home, I mean, it works for some people, but fewer and fewer in this industry. I know very few people who've sort of been at one place and stayed there for any significant period of time. We're usually a pretty nomadic race, animation writers and we tend to be moving all over the place. And I don't think that's a great thing, but it just seems to be the nature of the beast these days. Yeah, it always seems like animated shows don't seem to last more than a couple of seasons these days, which can make it difficult, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's tough to sort of, you know, you kind of wish that when one show ended, which is inevitable, that the place you're at would say, we love you, let's give you this show now. And that happens (laughs) sometimes, but... I found it in my career to be pretty rare to sort of move from one show to another at the same place. Mm -hmm. Now I've bounced back and forth. So like I'll do a show at Warner Brothers, go away for a few years, come back to another show at Warner Brothers. Yeah. Same at Disney, same at Sony, a lot of places. But even doing two shows in a row at one place, it's almost never happened. And it's kind of sad, but they're always looking for the next new thing and the next new person. And I think there's this sort of natural tendency of the grass is always greener so that it, they've got a person there. It's not that they didn't like working with them, but they may go, well, but let's try this guy. He's been work, doing great work over at Hasbro. Maybe he'll do something great for us. And they let you go in favor of this new person. And then, you know, you become the new person next time. Yeah. Because Greg, we love Greg. and He's been doing great work over at Nickelodeon. Let's bring him back, you know, kind of thing. And that can be frustrating, honestly, it can. But uh, like I said, it's sort of the nature of the beast these days. The era of sort of being at one company for your whole career just seems for the most part to have Thanks. Uh, that was quite an illuminating insight into a bit of the industry and, and your own experience of it. Outside of that, when you're not working, what do you like to watch on film or TV when you have the time? I mean, I'm guessing superhero stuff is right up your alley, for example. Yeah, sometimes, although I'll be honest, you know, I don't watch a ton of animation, for example, because it feels like work to me. <laughs> and that's not rational because animation is just a medium. It's about storytelling. But at the same time, I'm so intimately involved in working in animation day in, day out. You know, all the little details of it. First off, I notice a lot of flaws in animation that I think the average person wouldn't. Yeah. And it just feels a little bit like work. And once upon a time when superhero stuff was rare and I was desperate for anything, yeah, I'd watch anything and everything superhero. But again, nowadays I work, you know, I'm doing Young Justice. I work in superheroes every day. I don't feel quite the desperate need to watch a lot of superhero stuff. Although yeah. I still watch a lot of 
genre stuff. Again, watching superheroes, particularly for me, DC superheroes, feels like work. And it feels <laughs> like I'm always sort of comparing what they did to what I would do. And, and that's not fair to those creators. It's not really great for me. So I tend to avoid most other DC comics interpretations at least these days. But, you know, I'm watching... What am I watching? I am watching the second season of Jessica Jones right now. Mm -hmm. I'm watching Shakespeare Uncovered. Uh, I really enjoyed Preacher, the first two seasons. I haven't seen season three yet. I am watching last year's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., catching up on that. I love The Good Place. That's a fantastic show. Yeah, that's one of my favorites as well. So clever. Yeah, that's definitely one of my favorites. My wife and I watch Big Bang Theory and Young Sheldon. She really loves Young Sheldon. We watch Speechless, the new Murphy Brown. And my daughter and I started watching Kidding, the new Jim Carrey show. Uh, We've only seen a few episodes, but we're sticking with that for the time being. And there's a handful of other things that I'm watching either with my son or my daughter or my wife or some combination thereof. My kids are grown up, so yeah. when I say I watch it with them, what that means is that both my kids live in Washington, D.C., and so they'll watch an episode in D.C., I'll watch it in L.A., and then we'll call each other and talk about what we saw before we go on to the next episode. So don't binge it, per se, yeah. because we want to talk in between each episode. But that's not as fun as watching TV with them, but they're grown-ups and have their own lives. I don't know who gave them permission to do that, but uh, <laughs> that's the next best thing to yeah. watching with them. You found that middle ground, so that's good. You can sort of keep united through the magic of television, so whatever yeah. works, I suppose. So in terms of Gargoyles, it was a different flavour for Disney at the time. It was a bit more mature compared to other kids' shows at the time. I'm guessing that was part of the mandate you were sort of given when developing the show, or or was that something you brought to it? You wanted something a bit more complex for younger audiences to watch? No, I mean, it definitely wasn't a mandate, and I don't think it was a plan per se. In fact, when we originally developed the series, we developed it as an adventure comedy modeled very much on Disney's Adventures of the Gummy Bears. And Gummy Bears was a show that we were doing at Disney, created by a guy named Jim Magon. I worked on the tail end of it just a little bit as a current programming executive, so I don't take any credit for it whatsoever, but I loved it and thought it didn't get enough respect. It was an original property, and the only thing that was, in essence, borrowed was the name and what the name inspired from the candy. And we felt that there was a lot of market confusion between Gummy Bears and another show called Care Bears. Both shows featured these cute, cuddly, multicolored bears Care Bears was sort of a saccharine sweet show that I couldn't stand, at least at the time. And Gummy Bears was this rich, wonderful show with this great medieval backstory and all these great ideas and great adventures and fun and funny and all this great stuff. And yet we were the ones named after a candy. So I think the confusion was understandable. So we set out in 1991 to create a show in the Gummy Bears mode that would have that kind of great, rich backstory to it. Still a comedy adventure, but gain a little more respect. And in the 90s, the big word was edge. Everything had to have Mm -hmm. edge. It had to be edgy. (laughs) So we made a couple of choices to make the show edgier. The first and most obvious one is that instead of cute, cuddly, multicolored bears, we do cute, cuddly, multicolored gargoyles. So they'd be these little monsters. They'd still be cute, still be cuddly, still be multicolored, but they'd be monsters instead of teddy bears. And the second choice was that we would have this rich medieval backstory, but we would cast a spell on our gargoyles and put them to sleep for a thousand years and have them wake up in the 20th century. And we felt that setting the show in the present was also edgier than setting it in the past. And we created this great, fun comedy show around these gargoyles, and we pitched it to Michael Eisner, who at the time was the chairman of the Walt Disney Company, and at the time picked all the shows that we did, had final say. And he did not like it. So we were bummed, but my 
bosses, Gary Kreisel and Bruce Cranston, and to a certain extent, Jeffrey Katzenberg, thought there was still something in the idea. So sent me, in essence, back to the drawing board to try and see if I could fix it, see if I could find a different way to approach it. I uh, pitched the show to a few people within Disney TV Animation to sort of get feedback on it, on the pitch. And one of the people I pitched to was a guy named Tad Stones, who created Darkwing Duck. And when you look at the sort of history of Disney TV Animation, those two guys, Jim Magon, who created Gummy Bears, and Tad Stones, who created Darkwing Duck, they were really the founding fathers of that division with Gary Kreisel. And Tad suggested he had seen a preview, uh, the movie wasn't out yet, but he had seen a preview of Beauty and the Beast, a work print. And he said, "What you know, you, we had a human female character who was a friend of the gargoyles. He said, instead of all these little gargoyles, what if you had one big gargoyle and you did a sort of Beauty and the Beast thing with the human girl? And this really resonated for me. Again, my background was comic books. I've worked at DC Comics and, and superheroes. And I thought, yeah, we could make one gargoyle who is kind of like a superhero without any of the trappings of superheroes, no capes, no tights, but we could do that. And so the artist Greg Guler and I created the character of Goliath, who did not exist in the comedy development at all, but we took all the comedy characters from that development, put them through the prism of Goliath, and came out the other end, fundamentally with the show that you saw on the air. And that became Gargoyles, and we got very enthusiastic about the show. And again, no one was sitting there going, let's make this more mature per se, but we definitely wanted something different. And one of the things that appealed to Gary specifically about this new version of the show was that it would help diversify the Disney afternoon. The Disney afternoon up to that point had been 100% funny animal cartoons. And we loved those cartoons and each show was unique and great, but Gary was concerned that the, block, the programming block, at least in the United States, the two-hour block of funny animal cartoons, might feel homogenous, and the audience, no matter how good all the shows were individually, might just start to get tired of that genre and have, in essence, funny animal fatigue. So we made a conscious decision at that point to diversify the Disney afternoon. We, on the one hand, started doing these wild sort of Tex Avery-style shorts with a show called Schnookums and Meat. And on the other hand, we decided to do a boys' action show, what they called in those days a boys' action show, like Gargoyles. So we took Gargoyles not, per se, in an older, more mature direction, but definitely in a more action-drama direction, in part in thanks to Batman the Animated Series. And we weren't trying to emulate Batman, but the fact that that series was working and had an audience gave us the confidence to try something in that genre for the Disney afternoon. And so we created this huge pitch for Gargoyles with all these cool elements because the ideas were coming fast and furious and we had the pack and we had the mutates and we had all this stuff and we pitched the show to Michael six months after the comedy pitch and he didn't like it and he passed. And that was sad because we really come to like the show a lot, but you know, he killed it. Yeah. And the next day, we have what we call the post-mortem meeting where we discussed what had happened in the Big Michael meeting with Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was head of the whole company, the whole Disney company. Jeffrey was in, head of the studio in, in those days. And we were talking about Goof Trooper Bonkers or one of those shows which had sold and how we were going to approach it and what we were going to do next and everything. And then as we're standing up to leave, Jeffrey turns to me and says, and you're going to work on Gargoyles some more. And this completely caught me off guard. And I looked at Bruce Cranston, who was also surprised. And I later found out that Gary had had a conversation with Jeffrey about the need for diversity in the afternoon. But um, I didn't know that at the time. And I said, well, no, Michael killed it. We pitched it as a comedy. He killed it. We pitched it as an action drama. He killed it. I think it's dead. And Jeffrey said, no, no, Michael didn't kill it. He just thought it needed more work. Now, I had been there the day before, and I know Michael killed it. (laughs) But what this was saying to me was that Jeffrey thought there was something in it, and he wanted us to pursue it. So we went back to the drawing board for a third time. 
And myself and my team, we took a, a long, hard look at the show. What are we going to change about this show this time? And we came to the conclusion that we weren't going to change anything at all about the show. There was nothing wrong with the show. It was a great show. This was the show we wanted to make. The problem was not the show. It was the pitch. The pitch was too diffuse. It had too many elements. The fact that we had put the pack and the mutates and all this stuff in it showed a level of our enthusiasm, but it overwhelmed the idea for Michael. And mm -hmm. so we just cut things from the pitch ruthlessly. We mm -hmm. focused it on what Tatton suggested in the first place on the Beauty and the Beast idea. By that time, the movie had come out, and I don't know if you remember, but it was something of a hit for the Walt Disney Company. Yeah. <laughs> so we thought Michael would get the Beauty and the Beast idea with some clarity, we still had one card talking about the trio, Brooklyn, Lexington, Broadway, one card about Hudson, one card about Bronx, one card each about Xanatos and Demona, so we could show that we had some good villains. But otherwise, we just maintained the focus on the gargoyle Goliath and the human Elisa, police detective, Elisa Maza. And we went back in six months later. At this point, we've been working on the show for a couple of years, two and a half years, I think. And we pitched the show again, and this time Michael bought it. And I will say to Michael's credit, for as long as we were doing Gargoyles, once he bought into it, he became a major supporter of the show, as Jeffrey was, as Gary was, as Bruce was. And so we had marching orders. We had a show to make. But we had a small problem, which is that, you know, no one at Disney had done that kind of show before. So Tom Rizika over in production was looking for a directing producer, and I was looking for a story editor to do the show. And we, both of us went through a number of people trying to find just the right fit. But in the meantime, we had deadlines. And so someone had to make creative decisions about the show until we found the producers to take over and make those decisions. And so I found myself, since I've been the one guy on the project from day one, making all these creative decisions about the show as we moved forward. Then Tom found Frank Parr. I found Michael Reeves, who did absolutely fantastic work on the show, both of whom we stole from Batman the Animated Series. But by that time, I was incredibly invested in this particular show, and I didn't want to walk away as I normally would as a development executive. So I went to Gary and Bruce, and I said, look, I want to produce this show with Frank. And they were hesitant, shall we say. <laughs> they were like, you've never produced a show before. And I said, well, that's true. But four and a half years ago, I'd never been a development executive before, and that worked out all right. So ultimately, they uh, let me do it. Again, it's a little more complicated than that, but it yeah. still comes down to the fact that Frank and I produced two seasons of Gargoyles, uh, 65 episodes total, before we both moved on to DreamWorks. And in terms of it being more mature, which I guess is your original question, long way around to get there, <laughs> the main thing was that we just decided we would make the show we wanted to see. Yeah. That all we could do is be passionate about what we wanted to do with the show, and if, in fact, that then in some way worked for the audience, that would be great. But we figured if we weren't passionate about it, there's no way the audience could be passionate about it. Yeah. And so we went about making the show we would like to see. And then we just crossed our fingers that the audience would be there. And they were, particularly season one. We were the number one show in our category. And we were a big hit, home run as we'd say here. And then season two, we did well. We were still a hit, a single, maybe a double. But when season two happened, two things happened that really sort of hurt us in the ratings. One was the O.J. Simpson trial was going on, and we were constantly preempted mm -hmm. for trial coverage. And the second thing was that a show premiered on Fox called Power Rangers. And Power Rangers was a blockbuster and they took the number one slot week in and week out and we were consistently number two we did well but we never beat them ever not mm -hmm. once which was a bummer but those were the facts and so we had done 13 episodes the first season 52 episodes the second season and then we were canceled and then disney bought abc and ABC needed a boys' action show for Saturday morning, and so they decided to pick up 13 episodes 
for a version of Gargoyles that they called the Goliath Chronicles. They offered it to me, but they offered it with a demotion from producer to story editor, and they gave me a schedule that at the time seemed impossible, and so I walked away, and I didn't do much more. I wrote the first episode of season three, although the producer who took over re-edited the episode, changed the order of things that kind of, from my point of view, made a mess of it. Mm. And then the other 12 episodes, I had almost nothing to do with. I advised them, but they rarely took my advice. So from a fan standpoint, we just don't count that third season. (laughs) Not just me, although I feel strongly about it, but fans as well sort of feel that the characters were out of character and that the stories didn't live up to the kind of stuff we had done in the first two years. And so we later did a comic book of Gargoyles and Gargoyles Bad Guys, and we did 18 issues, and we sort of think of that as the canon third season of the show. And we sort of skip over that Goliath Chronicles season, which had a lot of really great people working on it. But I just think the three people who were running the show at the top were not given the time to familiarize themselves with the show and they had to hit the ground running and I have great sympathy for them, but they just didn't know the show well enough and what they did just didn't feel like part of the tapestry of the thing. It it felt like some separate version. So we tend not to count it. I'll need to see if I can find that comic book then. See, but the real third season is... Season three is definitely the weakest from my point of view. Although, I mean, I didn't actually get into the show until a few years ago. I think I tried to watch it when I was younger, but I think I was too young for it at the time. You know, it kind of the more complex storytelling went over my head a little bit. But, you know, as I've gotten older, I can appreciate the fact that Goliath isn't written to be right as other leaders like Optimus Prime or someone where at the time, and I really like that. And I, I mean, my favorite animated shows are the ones that don't talk down to kids, you know, kind of appreciate the fact that there are a lot of smart, younger people out there and adults might want to watch it too. So, you know, well done with that. And I think that's reflected in all your work as well. Well, the idea is to write on, on layers. So, you know, whether it's Young Justice or Spider-Man or Gargoyles or Witch or whatever, if I'm showrunner or one of the showrunners on a project, the game plan is to write in layers so that on the one hand, there's plenty of eye candy, plenty of fun stuff, you know, gargoyles, humor, explosions, plenty of stuff for a younger audience, maybe not, you know, three and four year olds, but yeah. even six year olds, I handle it to just enjoy on that level. But there's also things that may go over the kids heads, but they won't know it's going over their heads. So that's the trick to it. I mean, it, yeah. If you're writing in such a way that the kids can't follow your story, then that's a problem. Mm -hmm. But if you're writing it so that they can follow the story, but that an older audience is also getting more out of the story. One of the things that we did on Gargoyles and on a lot of the shows I've done is we didn't serialize. The show was still episodic. Every story had its beginning, middle and end to it. But the episodes were sequential. We tried to air them as much as possible in order. Yeah, because you get a lot more out of the show if you were watching the tapestry of the entire season, tapestry of the entire series in order. And so the idea was, particularly in those pre-streaming, pre-binge days, was we knew any episode could be somebody's first episode. So that mm-hmm. episode had to have a beginning, middle, and end, had to be cohesive enough that people would enjoy it. Our hope was then that they'd see that episode and go, wow, I like this. Let me watch the next episode. And, oh, I missed a few. Let me go back when they rerun them and see the ones that I missed because I like this show. Nowadays, people binge. You can't binge Gargoyles now unless you buy every episode on iTunes or you buy the DVD sets, which are all available for the first two seasons. But then you could just sit down and binge them from beginning to end. But in general, you know, and we run into this on Young Justice, you know, we're doing season three of Young Justice. Well, we don't expect anyone to start with season three because why would you? You can binge season one and two and go into season three. Why start in the middle when you can start at the beginning? Yeah. Um, but in those days, we had to assume that 
things aired and then they were gone and they would rerun eventually, but you couldn't just call it up when you wanted it. Mm -hmm. So we had to assume that any episode we aired could be the first episode for some portion of our audience. And so we worked that way. Yeah. And the approach meant that it had a really rich mythology. I always liked the approach to time travel. You know, the fact that you kept with the closed loop thing, everything that you you see sort of happen in the past pays off as you see the intervention sort of later on, like Xanatos send himself a coin, for example, to make himself rich, all that stuff, you know, I thought was really clever. And, and you wouldn't have got that if it was purely episodic, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, I like strict time travel rules. Cargos were the strictest rules and my preference for how to work time travel. I think otherwise it allows for a lot of writerly cheat. When I worked on other shows with time travel, for example, Young Justice, because it's based on the DC universe, I was as strict as possible with the rules, but I couldn't be as strict as I was on Gargoyles because we were adapting the DC universe. I had to yeah. honor what the choices that people at DC had made. Other shows I've worked on where I haven't been a showrunner on it, I've still done a bunch. I did some time travel stories for Ben 10, for example. And again, I tried to be as strict as I could, but again, it's within the context of someone else's property. And I did one on The Mummy. And for a while, I kind of was like everyone's time travel go-to guy. And I did a <laughs> bunch of time travel shows in a row. I did one on The Batman. And always, again, from my point of view, trying to use the strictest possible rules to yeah. avoid cheating. But again, having to honor each individual show's particular rules. So, yeah, time travel stories are fun for me. But one thing that sometimes bugs me by watching it on television is those episodes where by the time it's over, everyone's forgotten what took place and <laughs> the whole world's changed. And to me, I've seen a lot of great stories with that, but I've also seen a lot of stories where it just feels like a cheat. So I try yeah. to avoid that. Consequences are definitely better. Absolutely. And was Scottish history a particular interest of yours? There's quite a lot of kind of medieval Scotland in Gargoyles. It is now. It wasn't when I started. <laughs> the reason we chose Scotland as the medieval location for our show had a lot more to do with suspension of disbelief. Our characters were going to be speaking English. Yeah. We're making the show in America. I have all these magical justifications for why the audience is hearing English in Scotland in the year 994, <laughs> that actually what you were hearing was translated Gaelic, etc., old Gaelic, actually, or middle Gaelic. But we didn't want to bump the audience on that stuff, particularly since our gargoyles were going to wake up in 20th century Manhattan and be speaking yeah. English. So behind the scenes, I've got these magical reasons for how this worked, but we just didn't want it to burden the audience with that. And we didn't want to bump the audiences or wanted to bump them as little as possible. So one choice that we made instead of, for example, setting the show in France, where you'd expect people to speak French, <laughs> um, <laughs> we decided to set it in an English speaking country. And we chose Scotland because it felt rougher than England. The wilderness was more natural. Everything was just starker and, and more contrast. And it just felt a little less civilized than at least the connotation of England felt to us. Yeah. So we did the first five parter, uh, really just the first episode and a half set in Scotland. And, you know, I worked this story out with Paul Lacey, who was my development assistant at the time, or development associate, and with various writers, but ultimately with Michael Reeves. And we were like, all right, let's have Vikings attack. And why did we choose Vikings? Because Vikings are cool. Uh, yeah. It wasn't like, oh, we did research and it should be Vikings. It was like, yeah, it's, it's the 10th century. Let's throw in Vikings, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> After the fact, a little bit of research told us that we had actually accidentally been accurate. <laughs> but in fact, Vikings were attacking the west coast of Scotland <laughs> in those years. And we had just by accident gotten it right. And that, that <laughs> inspired me to say, well, if we've gotten it right up to this point, let's not screw it up now. Let's actually do some research and continue to get it right. 
So I had a couple people doing research for me. One was my assistant at the time, Monique Beatty, who's now a big mucky muck at DreamWorks. And the other was just a friend of mine, a woman named Tuppence McIntyre, who wasn't in the industry at all. She is a deputy district attorney here in Los Angeles, but she's a woman of Scottish descent and was interested in Scottish history. And so Monique and Tuppence did a bunch of research for us on that period in Scotland. And we had introduced the character of Macbeth. And of course, I knew Macbeth from the Shakespeare play, but I didn't know anything about Macbeth beyond that. And they did all this research and were like, oh my God, the actual true history of Macbeth is even more interesting than the (laughs) play. And the history of the Scottish kings in that period was fascinating. So we had created a character called Prince Malcolm. We didn't know what exactly he was prince of or whatever. (laughs) We just decided that he was a fictional character, but we would make him the younger brother of the King of Scotland. And so we would work our fictional characters in with the real history and try as hard as possible not to contradict that history. We would augment it. We would add to it by having, you know, gargoyles in it. Magic Um, and all that stuff, yeah. Right, but we would not contradict any known facts. Now, there might be things that took place behind the scenes that the history books didn't record, or history, you know, a couple hundred years later was like, you know, all the oral tradition says that there were gargoyles involved in this, but that part must be a myth. So <laughs> we'll skip that part and just write down the stuff about the kings, yeah. you know. And we worked very hard to make sure that we were as accurate as possible with the history within the sort of fantasy context that we were doing, including the time travel and all that stuff. But it was great because it gave us all these great stories. We told the story of King Kenneth's assassination. We told the story of King Constantine, Mount Calvum. All these great, real characters became part and parcel of our tapestry because we did all this research. So, yeah, I, I am now incredibly fond of Scottish history, <laughs> but it was something that we totally stumbled on. I mean, probably shouldn't admit that. Probably should make it look <laughs> like, oh, yeah, that was a point day one. But the truth is, is that... You know, it was just, hey, Scotland, because them speaking English in Scotland won't throw the viewers as much as if we said it in France. And Vikings, because Vikings are cool. (laughs) And those elements became the backbone of a huge section of our storytelling because it was just so much fun. Cool. That's actually a great insight into to that. I mean, I had no idea. It's just being Scottish myself, I was very interested in how it became part of the kind of mythology because I guess in the 90s it was unusual to have Scotland represented in such a way. So it's definitely a plus as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I mean, I'm thrilled that we did it. And the thing about Garvels in particular is that the project was almost blessed. I'm not saying it wasn't hard work. It was a lot of hard work. But things just kept sort of falling in our lap. Things just sort of worked. <laughs> out. At one point, we had created a nefarious geneticist named Anton Severia, played by Tim Curry. Really fun character. And then after we created this character, there was a news report about this guy in Italy named, I'm going to get the name wrong because it's been 20 plus years, but uh, something like Severino Antoninus. And we're like, you got to be kidding me. (laughs) We created Anton Severius and then this real guy, this geneticist, is cloning sheep or whatever in Italy, and his name is Savario Antoninus. It's like he, that can't be true, but it was. Maybe it was you have some latent like, psychic power that you don't know about. Well, it's funny because what I began to feel about the show, and this is true of any show or project that's really working, it's really seeing. I begin to feel like Michelangelo used to tell this story, I'm told, not that I've met Michelangelo personally. <laughs> I'm old, but not that old. Uh, That'd be season four of Gargoyles, bring him in. Right. That he used to look at a block of stone and he could see the statue inside it and that his job was simple. He just had to chip the excess away to reveal the statue inside, which is a really preposterous way of looking at this historic talent, right? But that's how he felt about it. And sometimes when a show is really working like Gargoyles was, that's kind of how it feels. Like somewhere in an alternate universe, the Gargoyles really exist, and all I'm doing is tapping into (laughs) those stories and telling them. It feels that real to me. Those characters feel that real to me. 
and it just seems to all work out. This is a spoiler if you haven't seen the show, so I'm warning your audience up front, but in season two, we revealed that character of Owen Burnett was actually Puck. And the way that came about was interesting too, because Owen was a character that we knew there was something mysterious about. There was something interesting about Owen, who was Xanatos' assistant, executive assistant. But we didn't know what that was. We hadn't figured it out. And then we were working on an episode called Eye of the Beholder, where we introduced the character of Puck. And I was at my office and just thinking about this stuff, and suddenly it hit me that Owen was Puck in disguise. And I immediately called Bryn Chandler and Lydia Morano, who were writing that episode. You know, I called them up and I said, listen, listen, Owen is Puck. And they weren't working in the Disney offices. They were working at, I think, Lydia's house, or maybe Bryn's house. I can't remember now. But their response was, we know. (laughs) Like, it was so perfect that separately we had both come up with this idea that Owen and Puck were the same person. So we began planting seeds because we didn't reveal it in that episode, but we began planting seeds in that episode to reveal it way down the line. But again, it was just one of these things where it was in the air and the show was just working so well that the solutions often, once we found them, seemed so obvious. It was like, why did this take us so long to figure out? (laughs) And it just all seemed to work, to click, to connect. Cool. In terms of the cast, I mean, it had an excellent voice cast. Did you have a hand choosing them? And are you a Star Trek fan by any chance, considering how much much of the Next Generation cast you had in there? (laughs) I am, although, again, that's not quite... we. The Star Trek thing is, again, something we stumbled on, not something we (laughs) planned. Both they were popular at the time. Yeah, it was a phenomenal cast. The thing that happened with the Star Trek actors is that we held auditions. And one of the first people, if not the first person to come into audition was Marina Sirtis, who came in to read for Elisa Maza. All right. And she wasn't right for Elisa, but we loved her voice. And we thought, you know, she could be perfect for Demona. Problem was, we didn't have the copy ready for Demona yet. So we had to ask her to come back. And she was literally the first person to read for Demona, and she knocked it out of the park. Marina herself will tell you that she caught us off guard because she played Deanna Troy on Next Generation, was still playing that character at that time. Yeah. And, of course, Deanna is literally the nicest person in the entire Alpha Quadrant. <laughs> Yet Marina will, herself will tell you that she's much more like Demona in real life than she is like Deanna. And she just loved playing the villain for a change. And Jonathan Frakes came in and auditioned for Xanatos, and he was fantastic, and we cast him. And again, it wasn't like a plan. It was just those were the two people who were right for those parts. Yeah, the Jonathan Frakes insists that Xanatos look like him. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And later... We held auditions for the regulars, but we wouldn't hold auditions for guest cast. Mm -hmm. We didn't have time to hold auditions every time we were casting a new part. So, you know, we'd be in the booth recording an episode, and our voice director and casting director, Jamie Thomason, would say, okay, you know, we'd be on a break, and he would say, okay, so what are we going to need for next week? And I'd say, for example, something like, well, we need Goliath's brother, Cold Stone. So we need someone who's got the kind of chops that Keith David, who's our wonderful voice actor who played Goliath, yeah. has someone who feels like he can hold his own with Keith. Who can we find with those kind of chops? And, you know, we'd look through the glass into the booth, and there's Jonathan Marina sitting there, and I'd be like, well, what about Michael Dorn? <laughs> and it wasn't like I'm trying to get more Star Trek people. It's just we're trying to think of someone who works in that part, and those two Star Trek actors who were in there would suggest, not literally like they were coming in saying, hey, you should use this person, but just the fact that they were there suggested to us, oh, what about this guy? What about LeVar Burton for Nancy? Uh, what about Brett Spiner for Puck? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. We cast Michelle Nichols of the original Star Trek series. She played, obviously, Lieutenant Uhura, 
as Elisa's mother, Diane Mazza. And then at some point, the notion hit me, what if we got someone from every Star Trek series? So, <laughs> you know, we got a couple actors from Deep Space Nine, and we got Kate Mulgrew from Voyager. And again, this is mostly because we had this, the Star Trek pool of actors was this phenomenally talented pool of actors. And we had the advantage of uh, Marina and Jonathan who could go to them and say to a guy like Michael Dorn, you know, it's great. It's fun. Record with the cast. The scripts are good. It's three hours work. You don't even have to memorize the lines. You can have the script right in front of you. There's no costume. And guess what? Worf, no makeup. (laughs) Uh, And you just come in, spend three or so hours and you're out. And so they were great. And I'm still close with Marina and Jonathan and Brent and to a lesser extent, Michael and LeVar. They all did really great stuff for us. And, you know, at some point, yeah, you know, we began to see the publicity value of using Star Trek people. But I would never cast someone just for publicity value. You know, they have to be right for the part. Mm -hmm. But the pool of Star Trek actors, particularly in those days, was so great and so large that we could usually find great people among them. And, and we didn't use that exclusively, but we weren't shy about using it either. Cool. In this era of live action, big budget remakes of old properties, have you heard anything about Gargoyles getting that same treatment, the blockbuster treatment? Well, I mean, back in 1995, Touchstone Pictures hired Michael and I to write a treatment for a Gargoyles movie, mostly, I think, because Gary Kreisel sort of insisted that if they were going to do Gargoyles, they had to use us, which was nice of him. He didn't have to Mm -hmm. do that. The moment Gary left Disney, they fired Michael and I off the project. Oh, right. And they spent five years going through at least 10 writers that I know of, maybe more, but at least 10, trying to get a script that they liked, never quite finding it until executive named Nina Jacobson took over at Disney and she looked at this gargoyle thing and said, I don't get why this is fun. And she put it on a shelf. Since then, there have been various times when I've tried to revive it as a live action thing. And I think we were actually getting close at one point. And then Disney bought Marvel and Lucasfilm. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, when we've talked to Disney about it, it's really tough. And I understand. I mean, if you're going to spend a fortune on a big blockbuster live action movie, which Gargoyles, let's admit it, would have to cost because to do the Gargoyles in CGI and to in a live action film would be really expensive. You're talking Planet of so the Apes type to, effects, aren't you, at that point? Yeah, you'd have yeah. to take a pretty big risk. And they sit there and they go, well, we could make another Marvel movie, which is a pretty much a lock on doing well. The worst, and I don't mean worst quality-wise, but I mean commercially, the commercially worst Marvel movie still is a phenomenal hit. Yeah. And we can do a Star Wars film. Why would we take a risk on this obscure 90s TV show? So for me, I don't see it happening anytime in the near future. I do think once Disney launches their own streaming service, If they make Gargoyles available on that streaming service, the fans can then demonstrate simply by binge watching the show over and over again that there's an audience that loves Gargoyles and then anything's possible. Right now, Gargoyles isn't airing anywhere. The DVDs came out a long time ago and frankly, not a lot of people are buying DVDs anymore. It's tough to demonstrate to Disney its potential. Mm -hmm. But I think if we can get it on the streaming service, that's an incredibly binge-worthy show. And that can make a big difference. Just finding an audience again, basically. Yeah. So that was part one of my two-part interview series with Greg Weissman. Thanks to him for his time and wish him all the best in the future. Also, special thanks to YouTuber 331 Rock for his cover of the Gargoyles theme. If you enjoyed what you heard, then don't forget to hit subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts iTunes users, please do leave us a star rating and a comment. If you want to chat Gargoyles or anything else, then you can find us on Facebook or Twitter under the Music for Blog, or leave a comment on Music for Blog or Twitter YouTube. Keep an eye on the internet for part two, where we do a deep dive into spectacular Spider-Man.